We talked last time about how Thomas Jefferson was the first person to propose the idea of removing the native tribes uh, from within the borders of the then United States, which was all east of the Mississippi, removing them uh, west of the Mississippi River so as to make their lands available for uh, um, settling uh, by, uh, by white American settlers. However, there was a problem in that the U.S. didn't own any territory west of the Mississippi River. Until, of course, the Louisiana Purchase, made by Thomas Jefferson, uh, which changed things in that now all of a sudden there is plenty of territory out there where those uh, tribes can be removed to. Now, I have no doubt you are aware that sometime later, a quarter of a century later, uh, a later president, Andrew Jackson, uh, made that proposal of Thomas Jefferson a reality um, and uh, did so by the, uh, the passage of the Indian Removal Act, which barely passed in Congress, but did pass, and resulted in the removal of the tribes in the southeast uh, to uh, Indian Territory, which would later be known as Oklahoma. I'm sure you're aware of all that stuff, and uh, I go into a lot of detail about that in my Cherokee history class. Uh, but I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, those uh, removed tribes and the impact that they would ultimately have on the plains. And I'm going to bring your attention to something you might not have been aware of, which is that the forced removal happened as a result of Andrew Jackson, but a president uh, sometime before that, uh, James Monroe, who took office in 1817, uh, actually got the ball rolling uh, in as much as his policy was to try to get some of those southeastern tribes to voluntarily remove and to accept uh, new lands west of, uh, west of the Mississippi in exchange for their old lands. And some, some did, some Cherokees did, not a, um, not a majority of them, but a significant minority beginning in 1817 uh, started uh, making the trip out, not initially to uh, what is now Oklahoma, but rather to what is now uh, Western Arkansas, but then was, was a part of Indian Territory. So these, uh, these Cherokees who made that journey uh, in, beginning in 1817 came to be known as the Old Settlers. Uh, the uh, first Cherokees to, to head out head out west. And you can see in the uh, lower right-hand corner, that was Cherokee territory in Arkansas from 1817 until 1828. Uh, the upper right uh, kind of is uh, panning out a little bit uh, to show you the, that whole area, uh, the, all the different shades of green put together. That was called Arkansas Territory uh, as of 1819. Uh, it organized as, as a territory. Um, broken into uh, Arkansas Territory and Indian Territory in 1824, actually. Uh, the uh, dark green are the boundaries of the state of Arkansas, established finally in 1836. Now, you'll notice that the Cherokees, I said, were there until 1828. Uh, and that's because uh, when a movement was being made to try to establish Arkansas as a state and more people were moving west, including to western Arkansas, those old settlers were pushed farther to the west uh, into Indian Territory, uh, which would later be Oklahoma. Uh, so these other maps, I just have a big map of the U.S., just in case you're not a, uh, a geography quiz, uh, to give you some context of where these areas are. Uh, and then the lower left is to give you some context as to what the traditional territories of various tribes were. Now, this, this area that became later became Arkansas, where these first old settlers uh, first went to uh, was right around in there. And if you'll notice, that was already the territory of some other 
native tribes, which shouldn't be a surprise, right? Uh, this is something that people don't often think about when they think about Indian removal and the later Trail of Tears, the fact that not only were all those native people removed from their homes and sent out west, there were already people living there who suddenly had thousands more people dumped in their backyard, essentially. Uh, so this territory where the old settlers went out to, that was uh, uh, traditionally the territory of the Quapaw uh, and the Caddo. We've talked a lot about the, the Caddo. And uh, just uh, to, the, uh, to the west of uh, the area that the uh, old settler Cherokees uh, were given by the U.S., at least for a while, was the territory of the Osage, who also claimed uh, the territory where the Cherokees now were. And so that led to some, some issues, as we will see, as we will see in a moment. Now let's take a look at the uh, um, routes of removal that happened in the 1830s, just so we have that firmly in mind, uh, so that you can see the dates, right? So the first uh, tribe to, to move was the Choctaw in 1830. In 1832, the uh, Creeks and Chickasaws, uh, those Seminoles who went voluntarily and those Cherokees who went uh, voluntarily after the Treaty of uh, New Echota, which again is a whole other topic. Uh, so um, they're given land in the 1830s in what is today the eastern half of Oklahoma. And you can see their new territory in the light green. Uh, the point here is that to get there, they had to travel through Arkansas territory, many of them. Okay. Now, I, I said that there had been some, some issues already. There were, well, by issues, I mean people killing each other. There was, uh, there was open warfare between the Osage tribe and the old settler Cherokees uh, within a year uh, of the Cherokees' arrival. By 1818, 1819, there was a lot of fighting going on. And that continued uh, off and on for years between the Cherokees and the Osage. And then the Creeks later, who came out, came out there in the 1830s, they and the other uh, Cherokees who came later, wound up uh, having to uh, uh, to fight the uh, the Osage. Um, those uh, five quote unquote civilized tribes who wound up in eastern Oklahoma in the 1830s, uh, that area was bordered by um, well the Great Plains. Uh, which was Comanche and Kiowa territory. And the Comanches and the Kiowas did not particularly uh, like the idea of these new neighbors edging out onto their territory, into their hunting grounds. And so there was open warfare uh, between the uh, Comanches and Kiowas and the five tribes. That's uh, also something that uh, you know, most people don't think about, the fact that once the Trail of Tears happened and all these tribes got out there, they then had to organize themselves into militias to fight uh, the more traditional Plains Indians who, who were already there. Now, in 1833, a government commission called the Stokes Commission uh, laid out the boundaries for these uh, five quote-unquote civilized tribes in Indian territory, and all five tribes, the leadership of uh, those who were being removed, those who were uh, voluntary, uh, voluntarily removing at that time, uh, agreed to those new boundaries. However, the Osage, uh, who claimed uh, some of this territory also, did not agree to these boundaries. They weren't happy about it. Uh, so that continues then the tension uh, and occasional uh, bloodshed with the Osage. A couple of years after that, 1835, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, 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 negotiated a treaty with the Comanches and the Wichita uh, to allow uh, the uh, Indians who were traveling to their uh, new home voluntarily or not to pass through their territory. Uh, and that was a successfully negotiated treaty. And it was the very first U.S. treaty with any of the tribes from the Great Plains. Uh, a couple of years later, 1837, they uh, made similar treaties with the Kiowa and with the Plains Apache. 
Uh, and here we have a quote from one of the Muskogee Creek leaders, Raleigh McIntosh. Now let's take a look at what had been going these, on uh, on the, uh, at these what negotiations the when he was uh, uh, talking uh, about the uh, uh, and we're uh, looking at a, a very long. Rivalry. Essentially said, uh, we uh, must have enmity peace. between we are two all peoples of one the color. Call, uh, so or we're all Kansas, uh, tribe. we're all Indians, and the Pawnees, to their north. They uh, so we got to stick uh, together. Sworn enemies and, uh, since the uh, early 1700s. Uh, how, how, how long? How In long? In 1812. That uh, uh, the Pawnees a lot of bloodshed uh, in a major territory. It's not really going to be from on, uh, the um, the Comanches uh, or the Apaches, uh, principal or the Kiowas. Kansas villages it's going to be and internecine the, uh, Kansas among the uh, tribes who call were, were able to there. successfully again, defend their village uh, and inflict that's a topic heavy for casualties for a on class. the attacking Pawnee who had to retreat. Uh, but then the tables were turned and uh, Pawnees tried again uh, later that same year, and it went the opposite way. They inflicted heavy casualties upon the Ka or Kanza people. Uh, and uh, this was happening just a few years, uh, about five years before those old settlers started showing up in Arkansas, uh, western Arkansas. So they're starting to uh, hem in uh, the Kansas, uh, as are more and more of the white people who were coming in to settle by the 1830s. And so... Uh, uh, they had several bouts of uh, smallpox that further damaged their tribe. Uh, by the uh, 1840s, there were only four, uh, four Kanza uh, villages. But nevertheless, they, they combined their efforts and uh, uh, got back at the Pawnee. It took 30 years, but they got their revenge. Uh, they surprised a Pawnee village and killed about 80 people, taking 11 captives. Uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, explorer and military leader John C. Fremont uh, happened to be uh, to come across the scene uh, of some of uh, some of the carnage of, of this war and wrote about it. And again, the Pawnee got their uh, just like before; they got their revenge pretty quickly thereafter, burning one of those major Kansas villages. Meanwhile, uh, the Kaw or Kansas were also. Um, fighting against the uh, the Cheyenne, uh, so uh, they were having a hard time of it. Also having a hard time of it, not on the Great Plains, at least not as of yet. These two allied tribes uh, up in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin called the Sock and Fox tribes. Uh, they had become such close allies that. Uh, uh, by this time and thereafter, they were referred to as though they were one group, uh, Sock and Fox. Now, um, in the late 18-teens, they too had kind of been pressured to sign away some of their land. But uh, under the uh, administration of Andrew Jackson, uh, those uh, markers were being called in and they were told that they were going to have to give up their lands and they refused to do so uh, under the uh, under their leader Black Hawk. Uh, so that his name is is why that war came to be called the Black Hawk War. Uh, something else significant about Black Hawk, uh, he was uh, a Native American leader who who wrote his own autobiography, and it was a really good seller uh, at that time. Uh, so they were then removed from uh, their homeland. Uh, and ultimately, they were sent down to Kansas, uh, which, uh, again, uh, contributed to the pressure being added to the Kansas or Kaw tribe. Now, another tribe in the Great Lakes area, the Potawatomi, longtime close allies of the uh, Ojibwe in Ottawa, uh, they uh, were told that their lands were being taken away in Indiana, uh, and Illinois, and they were forced to walk what, what they called the Trail of Death because many of them died along the way, and they too were sent to eastern Kansas, same region where the Sock and Fox had wound up. Uh, the Potawatomi uh, often get forgotten. They weren't, they didn't have as large uh, numbers. They were, you know, uh, only 120th of the size, probably, of the Cherokee nation, but uh, they still 
suffered greatly for the same reasons. And they, they weren't a southern tribe. They and the uh, Sauk and Fox were Midwestern tribes. Those also got removed. Uh, the Potawatomi wind up in Kansas. They, they originally had been in uh, uh, Wisconsin and uh, the Michigan area. Then they wind up in Kansas and later still, uh, they uh, migrate southward into Texas because uh, tired of getting jerked around by the U.S. government. And then guess what? Uh, the U.S. government took over Texas. Anyway, uh, being from the same general region and uh, having suffered similar circumstances, the Potawatomi and the Sauk and Fox wound up being natural allies. And the same thing's happening with them, uh, except a little bit later. Uh, that had been happening with the Cherokees and the Creeks and the Choctaws, who wound up having to uh, fight to defend this new territory they had been sent to from the people who already lived in that territory and claimed it. Now, uh, the Sauk and the Fox wound up allying with the Potawatomi in a war against the Pawnees, because everybody goes to war with the Pawnees. Uh, that may be because they were so centrally located there in, in Nebraska, but it sure seems like everybody hated the Pawnee. Um, in 1853, uh, that war was expanded uh, beyond the Pawnees to basically the, the Sauk, Fox and, and Potawatomi against everybody. Uh, the Kiowas, the Comanches, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. Um, about 800 of those uh, Central and Southern Plains tribes attacked about 200 uh, Sock and Fox and Potawatomis in 1853. And it uh, turns out that the Sock and Fox and, and Potawatomis were much better armed. Uh, they had been fighting against the U.S. for, for longer, and they had, uh, had more opportunity to gain access to weapons uh, that were superior to the uh, weapons of these planes, Indians, some of whom had guns, but they were old guns, and many of whom still had bows and arrows. So in this big battle, uh, among the, uh, the immigrant Indians, or the Sauk and Fox and Potawatomi, uh, four of them were killed, and they killed over a hundred of the Plains tribes that attacked them. And here, here is a painting by the famous uh, painter of uh, old Western scenes, George Catlin, for whom Catlinite or Pipestone was named, uh, of something that he witnessed uh, of a battle between the uh, Sock and Fox and, and the Lakota around the same time. Uh, in fact, this probably was part of that same, that same war when the Plains tribes are trying to drive these various new tribes who had been driven there by the U.S., uh, trying to drive them back out. Uh, so again, a consequence of the Trail of Tears and the Trail of Death and the various other trails that uh, most people aren't aware of and don't think of. Now, with the Sock and Fox, I just want to mention one uh, particular uh, uh, member of, of, of that group who was born probably about 50 years after this, uh, 45 or 50 years, uh, after they had... Uh, both the uh, Sock and Fox and Potawatomis had been removed now to Oklahoma. Uh, and that's this guy, Jim Thorpe of the Sock and Fox Nation of Oklahoma. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but I hope you have. Uh, in 1999, uh, a uh, consortium of historians and sports writers chose Jim Thorpe as the number one greatest athlete of the 20th century. He was... Uh, a famous college football player for the Carlisle Indians, Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, uh, later an Olympic athlete who won multiple uh, gold medals, uh, although they were unfairly taken away, uh, and later became a uh, co-founder of the uh, NFL. Uh, he was a, a Sock and Fox Indian. Now let's talk about what was going on further south uh, in, in Texas. Now, we'll be talking in significant detail later about the Lipan Apache and the Mescalero Apache, so we won't uh, 
We won't cover them right now, but we'll talk about the other groups that were in Texas, uh, including, uh, although it's not on uh, this map, the Teos. Remember them? Uh, they were the uh, tribe that were encountered by the uh, Spanish uh, back in the 1540s uh, and, uh, and beyond in the 1500s, that area. Uh, they, were, they were long gone by the time the 1800s came around, either, either extinct or absorbed into the mestizo population of the Spanish and later the Mexicans. Uh, but their name lives on. Uh, Tejas, uh, Tejas, uh, meaning uh, friend in the Caddo uh, language. So here you see you've got the, uh, the Caddo, whom we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, the Comanche that we will also be talking about in great detail later. But these other groups uh, farther um, to the south, the Tonkawa and Central Texas and the uh, Konkawas and the uh, Coahuiltecan uh, along the coast. We'll just uh, take a brief look at them and see, see where they were. Uh, the Coahuiltecan uh, by the 1820s had gone the way of the Teos people, which is to say... Uh, that these hunter-gatherers uh, had been absorbed into the general population and no longer existed as a tribe. The Karankawa and the Tonkawa, however, continued to be distinct tribes. The Karankawa, called by the, uh, the Anglo settlers in Texas, Cronks for short, um, got a very raw deal. They, they had this... Uh, this long-standing myth about them, perpetuated originally by the Spanish, that they ate people, which they did not. Uh, however, the Anglo-Texans who wanted their lands uh, looked at the absolutely unquestionable truth that they're cannibals as a good excuse uh, to chase them away and kill most of them, which they did. And by the end of the 1800s, by the 1890s, the, the Cronks, uh, more properly, the Kronkawa, were, were extinct. Uh, again, either they had all died or what few were left had been absorbed into the general population. The Tonkawa, uh, they, they took the route once the, uh, not just the, the, with the Spanish and the Mexicans, but later with the Texans and the Americans, of trying to be nice uh, and always helping out the Europeans and then later the Americans. They... Uh, uh, they were part of military expeditions against the uh, Comanches and the Apaches. They served as scouts often. Uh, they, uh, several, uh, several of them uh, in large numbers sometimes uh, were part of expeditions uh, that included Texas Rangers attacking those other tribes. Uh, they came to be known as government Indians, uh, and that, uh, that did not help them at all in 1859. They were forcibly removed from Texas to Oklahoma. Now, the Caddo, uh, we've talked a lot about them, uh, who lived in East Texas and were a remnant of Mississippian culture uh, and uh, were uh, an agricultural people. And the Wichita, who were Caddoan and uh, who uh, did, however, ally with the Comanches to the extent that... Um, well, the, Wich the Wichita were a huge, powerful force in the region in the 1700s. Not so much by the 1800s. They had pretty well fallen by the wayside. Uh, they still were uh, traitors with the Comanches. Uh, and uh, that did not hold them in good stead uh, because uh, when the, uh, the Texans uh, became, when Texas became a republic and then a state, uh, and it was no longer a Mexican possession, but... Uh, a, uh, an Anglo, uh, a white uh, Anglo uh, possession, and the Comanches and the Texans did not get along. Uh, whenever the Comanches would do something, the Wichitas would get blamed for it or lumped in. Uh, so, 1859, the same time that the Tonkawas were, f were removed, uh, the, uh, the remaining Caddoan peoples and the, and the Wichitas were also removed to Oklahoma. So, uh, help the government, uh, help the U.S. government, the Texans, uh, or don't help them. Either way, turned out the same. Now, uh, the last group I want to talk about is, is a group that was only in Texas for a while, a few decades, the Cherokees. 
Now, remember, we talked about the old settlers who had gone from the original Cherokee homelands to western Arkansas and uh, who then were pushed out of Arkansas and into Oklahoma. But before that happened, before they were pushed out, some of the old settlers went uh, southward uh, into Texas, which was a part of Mexico at the time, uh, because they didn't trust the U.S. government. They wanted to uh, instead deal with the Mexican government. And so uh, they were there in East Texas for about 23 years. When the Texas uh, Revolution occurred, uh, the, uh, the Cherokees stayed neutral. They didn't want to make either side mad at them. Uh, they just wanted to be left alone. Uh, they had a good friend in Sam Houston, who was a former governor of Tennessee, uh, commanding general of the Texas Army, later first governor of Texas. Uh, they had a friend in him, uh, but when he was no longer governor, after he had uh, finished out his term, and Mirabeau Lamar uh, became governor, who was a guy that didn't have friendly relations with any Indians, but did have friendly relations with the land they were standing on, uh, in 1846, there was a war between the Republic of Texas and the Texas Cherokees. Uh, and the Texas Cherokees had the worst part of it. And they wound up having to flee back northward, back into Oklahoma, uh, back with the other old settlers whom they had broken off from and left and who kind of reluctantly took them back in. So they were folded back into the old uh, settlers of the Cherokees. And by the way, the 1830s, there's a couple more huge waves of Cherokees, some who came voluntarily, the last wave from the Trail of Tears, and they all eventually unified under one Cherokee government. But again, that is a story for a different class. At the beginning of this series of videos, I told you about how uh, I had originally taught this class uh, during the spring semester of 2020 and uh, the Rona hit us uh, and I had to switch over from uh, live classes to making lecture videos uh, and uh, so I had the second half of the class all filmed and everything but I didn't have the first class or first half and now I've 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 concluded the section that I did not originally record uh, in 2020. Uh, the first half of, uh, of that semester had actually been spent uh, with quite a bit of discussion, open discussion in, in the classroom. Uh, and we watched several, uh, watched several movies. Uh, we watched uh, Little Big Man and A Man Called Horace. Uh, and uh, uh, we... Um, like I said, we, 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 we talked about things. I answered questions on the fly and sometimes went uh, way off topic, sometimes went deeper in topics than otherwise I would have. Uh, but all that is to say uh, that I am now preparing you for a shock because although we're going forward in time to the 1840s now, having just discussed the 1830s, um, we're going forward in time, but we're also going backward in time uh, because uh, starting with the next video, you will be seeing uh, me from a year and a half ago. Uh, so uh, I thought I'd better warn you uh, so that you're not too shocked uh, because I have made some slight changes. Uh, and I also uh, wanted to, uh, to warn you that uh, some changes in... Uh, the quality of the videos, because that's when I was first learning how to do this. Uh, I hadn't got the best equipment yet, uh, so it's a little bit jerky in places, uh, and the sound quality is not as good as these previous videos have been. You'll probably have to turn the sound up louder at times, uh, but you should still be able to uh, to follow along, and uh, the people who were in that particular class all said uh, good things about uh, the lecture videos, so uh, uh, it's not that I am apologizing for them, but I am letting you know that when you start the next one, things will be a little bit different. All right, let's go.